The Niobrara Formation, also called the Niobrara Chalk, is a geologic formation in North America that was deposited between 87 and 82 million years ago during the late Cretaceous. The chalk formed from the accumulation of coccoliths from microorganisms living in what was once the Western Interior Seaway, an inland sea that divided the continent of North America during much of the Cretaceous. It underlies much of the Great Plains of the U.S. and Canada. During the time of the deposition of the Niobrara chalk, much life inhabited the seas of the Western Interior Seaway. By this time in the late Cretaceous many new lifeforms appeared such as Mosasaurs, which were to be some of the last of the aquatic lifeforms to evolve before the end of the Mesozoic. Tusatuthis is assumed to have preyed on other cephalopods, fish, and possibly even small marine reptiles. Tusatuthis was also preyed on by other animals, especially the many, various predatory fish of the western interior seaway. From shell isotope studies, it is thought that baculites inhabited the middle part of the water column, not too close to either the bottom or surface of the ocean. In some rock deposits baculites are common, and they are thought to have lived in great shoals. Fossil evidence of Cretolamna is found in deposits representing a diverse set of marine environments, indicating that it was able to adapt to a wide range of habitats. This may have attributed to its ability to exist through a long temporal range. The fusiform body of Cretolamna suggests it was a pelagic shark. While there is no solid evidence of members of the Tychoda species living among other durophagous sharks like members of Heterodontidae, it is believed that this Cretaceous macropredator was the precursor to crushing plate teeth seen in many similar sharks and rays. Tychotis would have predated benthic shelled invertebrates, however Tychotis itself was probably not benthic but more likely to be pelagic. Squalocorax was a coastal predator, but also scavenged as evidenced by a squalocorax tooth found embedded in the metatarsal bone of a terrestrial hadrosaurid dinosaur that most likely died on land and ended up in the water. The powerful kinetic jaws, high-speed capabilities, and large size of Cretoxorhina suggest a very aggressive predator. Cretoxorhina's association with a diverse number of fossils showing signs of devourment confirms that it was an active apex predator that fed on much of the variety of marine megafauna in the late Cretaceous. The highest trophic level it occupied was a position shared only with large mosasaurs such as Tylosaurus during the latter stages of the late Cretaceous. It played a critical role in many marine ecosystems. Scapinorhynchus had an elongated, albeit flattened snout and sharp all-shaped teeth ideal for seizing fish, or tearing chunks of flesh from its prey.
The guitarfish is a benthic fish, cruising along just above the sandy or muddy seabed and foraging for crustaceans, other invertebrates, and fish. It is an ovoviviparous fish with one or two litters of live young being born each year, each litter being four to ten fish. Gars tend to be slow-moving fish except when striking at their prey. They prefer the shallow and weedy areas of rivers, lakes, and bayous, often congregating in small groups. They are voracious predators, catching their prey in their needle-like teeth with a sideways strike of the head. They feed extensively on smaller fish and invertebrates such as crabs. Despite being a formidable predator, remains of Enchidus are commonly found among the stomach contents of larger predators. One of the genus' most notable attributes are the large fangs at the front of the upper and lower jaws and on the palatine bones, leading to its misleading nickname among fossil hunters and paleoctheologists, the saber-toothed herring. Although the closest living relatives of Somalichthys are lancetfish and lizardfish, the living animals would have resembled very large freshwater pikes. Their bodies were covered by large, heavy scuts. Typical of this species are narrow lower jaws with several series of teeth. Perhaps the most striking feature of Stratodus were its conical, inward-pointing teeth. It possessed multiple rows of these teeth which could reach 7 mm. These teeth were extremely numerous, with at least 6,000 being present in the fish's mouth, to the point that over 1,000 of the teeth are oriented outside of the jaws on the lips of the fish. Like other plethodid fish, Pentanogmius had enlarged and high dorsal and anal fins. The dorsal fin starts just posterior to the skull and extends over most of the body until just before the deeply bifurcated caudal fin. Sorocephalus is almost entirely represented by fragmentary specimens with the exception of a few complete specimens. It was extremely fast and it was probably a formidable open water ambush predator. The morphology of its teeth and jaw structure suggest it was a piscivore. Like its larger relative, Ichthyodects, Gillicus had numerous small teeth lining its jaws, and ate smaller fish by sucking them into its mouth but the teeth of Gillicus are so small that the jaws appear almost toothless at first, which has led to the suggestion that it was also a filter feeder. Species of Xyphactinus were voracious predatory fish. At least a dozen specimens have been collected with the remains of large, undigested or partially digested prey in their stomachs. Like many other species in the late Cretaceous oceans, a dead or injured individual was likely to be scavenged by sharks.
In its general body plan, Protosferina resembled a modern sailfish, though it was smaller with a shorter rostrum, was somewhat less hydrodynamic, and adults possessed large blade-like teeth. Recent research shows that the genus Protosferina is not at all related to the true swordfish family Zephyidae, but belongs to the extinct family Pachycormidae. One of the most significant features of Bonarichthys is the recognition that it was a filter feeder, living on plankton. This recognition that many large-bodied fish from the Mesozoic in the Pachycormidae were filter feeders shows that this niche was filled for at least 100 million years before previously known. Nearly all squamates are characterized by their cold-blooded ectothermic metabolism, but mosasaurs like Tylosaurus are unique in that they were likely endothermic, or warm-blooded. One of the largest marine carnivores of its time, it was an apex predator that exploited the wide variety of marine fauna in its ecosystem. The behavior of Tylosaurus towards each other may have been mostly aggressive, evidenced by fossils with injuries inflicted by another of their own kind. While mosasaurs are traditionally thought to have propelled themselves through the water by lateral undulation in a similar way to eels, the deep caudal fin of Platycarpus suggests that it swam more like a shark. Compared to the tylosaurs, plioplate carpine mosasaurs had much less robust teeth, suggesting that they fed on smaller prey such as small fish and squid. Clydasts was the one of the smallest of the mosasaurs. It was likely an agile swimmer that preyed upon cephalopods, fish and other small vertebrates in shallow water. Ectinosaurus was a rare genus of mosasaur with several unique characteristics that clearly separate it from other mosasaur genera. The most prominent of these features is its elongated jaws, elongated in a similar vein to other mosasaurs with elongated jaws like all plesiosaurs, Polycotylus was a large marine reptile with a short tail, large flippers, and a broad body. Examination of the fetus of Polycotylus indicates that while in the womb, plesiosaurs sacrificed fetal bone strength for accelerated growth rates.
The jaws of Dalakorinchops are not thought to have had a powerful bite force, however, this would be an unnecessary ability as it's the teeth that would do the work in prey capture. The teeth are long and thin which means that they are best suited for puncturing slippery soft-bodied prey. While most predators do not use gastroliths for grinding of food, almost all reasonably complete elasmosaur specimens include gastroliths. Although it is possible Styxosaurus may have used the stones as ballast, it appears likely that elasmosaurs use them as a gastric mill. Elasmosaurids were fully adapted to life in the ocean, with streamlined bodies and long paddles that indicate they were active swimmers. The unusual body structure of elasmosaurids would have limited the speed at which they could swim, and their paddles may have moved in a manner similar to the movement of oars rowing, and due to this, could not twist and were thus held rigidly. Plesiosaurs were even believed to have been able to maintain a constant and high body temperature, allowing for sustained swimming. Protostega is one of the largest turtles to ever swim in the ocean and so far. It is thought to have had a soft shell similar to the modern leatherback turtle. Protostega is thought to have grown so large by consuming a diet of soft organisms like jellyfish and cephalopods. Hesperornis was primarily marine, and lived in the waters of such contemporary shallow shelf seas. It is depicted with a mode of locomotion similar to modern loons or grebes, and study of their limb proportions and hip structure has borne out this comparison. Hesperornis were probably excellent foot-propelled divers, but might have been ungainly on land. While it was excellently adapted to swimming and diving, Baptornis is thought to have been clumsy on land, pushing itself along the rocks with its feet rather than actually walking. The natural position of the lower legs was flush against the body, with the feet stretched out sideways and thus it would have been unable to move upright without toppling over.
It is thought that Ichthyornis was the Cretaceous ecological equivalent of modern seabirds such as gulls. It is notable primarily for its combination of vertebrae which are concave both in front and back and several more subtle features of its skeleton which set it apart from its close relatives. Ichthyornis is perhaps most well known for its teeth. The teeth were present only in the middle portion of the upper and lower jaws. Because of the insufficient fossil remains, the size of an adult Claosaurus remains uncertain, but it was certainly a dwarf hadrosaur. Like other hadrosaurs, it was an herbivore. A few scientists had initially hypothesized that this crest, which resembles an enormous antler, may have supported a skin headsail used for stability in flight. While there is no fossil evidence for such a sail, studies have shown that a membranous attachment to the bony crest would have imparted aerodynamic advantages. Pteranodon is the most famous pterosaur, frequently featured in dinosaur media and strongly associated with dinosaurs by the general public. The wing shape of Pteranodon suggests that it would have flown rather like a modern-day albatross. Adult Geosternbergia specimens may be divided into two distinct size classes, small and large, with the large size class being about one and a half times larger than the small, and the small being twice as common as the large. Both size classes lived alongside each other, and while researchers had previously suggested that they represent different species, Christopher Bennett showed that the differences between them are consistent with the concept that they represent females and males, and that Geosternbergia species were sexually dimorphic. <laughs> 